And uh, yeah, let's get started. All right, so I hope uh, everyone is doing good today. You know, Friday, uh, probably prepared for either A, your flight back to uh, home for later tonight. You know, good luck navigating the airport and all that, um, or probably heading back to Boston. But um, I do appreciate you all coming today to listen to my talk. Gotta go fast. How we started the Ubuntu HPC team. Um, so if you do kind of look at the emojis here, I always like to use emojis, maybe kind of age myself a bit as a child of the 2000s. Um, but if you do see the little hedgehog up top there, um, that's to kind of signify that the Sonic reference was very intentional there. Um, so yeah, uh, just do a quick little introduction, you know, something I always like to do for talks, to just kind of say like, you know, what do I like to do for fun? You know, what do I do professionally? Kind of what's my background? Um, so. Obviously, if you've seen the you know bright orange booth in the sea of blue um, throughout the uh, exhibit hall with all the uh, booths you know for different projects and whatnot, um, I'm associated with Canonical, so I am a high performance computing engineer with them. Um, I'm also a uh, recognized Ubuntu member, so kind of seen as a regular contributor to the community. Um, I'm also the chair for the Ubuntu Summit. Um, so last year we organized one in Riga, and this year we're actually going for the Netherlands. So. If you're looking for anything fun to do, you know, in late October, should uh, come to that. Um, I'm also an UbuCon organizer, so those are more like local, regional events. You know, like to kind of meet up with nerds and talk about nerd things. You know, um, and then I'm also a Snap Crafter, so I like to build snaps. And then last thing is, I am the not so ancient elder of Ubuntu HPC. And so if you're wondering what that is, um, that's fine. You know, it's just kind of a little fun nickname created one day. But um, kind of the real gist of this here is that the not so ancient elder of um, Ubuntu HPC. And so if you're wondering what that is, um, first of all, uh, HPC, you know, it's an acronym uh, for high performance computing. And then probably a little small from back there, you know, I was looking at the uh, screen to assess the text size, but this is kind of our very flowery uh, definition that we kind of made at a couple of uh, wordsmithing sessions and all that. But the kind of key goal of our community is to actually focus on how we can make um, Ubuntu a better distribution for high performance computing workloads. So big reason for that um, was you know kind of looking at the data you know a few years ago and seeing you know the challenges that were presented by CentOS effectively being moved upstream um, to be ahead of RHEL um, for release cycle. We effectively decided like oh you know we should actually you know see about focusing on making Ubuntu a better distribution for those kinds of workloads see where our gaps are, you know, and what we could potentially bring to the industry as a whole. Um, and so that's how we ended up forming our community. And then if you see the link at the bottom, that's our team page. So you might look at that and be like, hey, that sounds great. You know, uh, we're, we're getting the gang together. Um, but you might effectively look at that and say, why? why? Why would we actually want to go ahead and do something like that? And why would Ubuntu need an HPC team? Clearly, we're doing okay desktop wise, you know, doing well on server. So why do we want to actually pivot and also focus on high performance computing? Well, the big thing is actually that high performance computing is used pretty much everywhere. Um, so for example, you know, kind of some key industries to highlight here where HPC is very popular um, is for like aerospace. So like modeling new airplanes, obviously you don't really want to take an agile approach as we learned with Boeing that, you know, Planes falling out of the sky is definitely not great, especially when human lives are at stake. Um, for example, you could also look at agriculture. Um, so if you could consider like understanding like how wildfires might spread, so like modeling that, understand you know what the impact onto the local food system could be. Um, finance really helps with fraud detection. Automotive, you know, another thing you don't want cars falling apart as prototypes. Um, construction as well, so modeling new buildings, and defense as well definitely helps for kind of researching materials and understanding you know data. And then also as well, um, the list goes on. You know, HPC is used pretty much everywhere where you kind of need to actually have the capability of processing lots of data. So electronics, energy, government, um, media, and entertainment. Um, very interesting. Some media companies actually use high-performance computing clusters to actually build the models that end up being in their animated movies. And the key thing to really take away from all of this is that like 75% of those workloads, which I have data, but you know I didn't. Link in here, but um, the idea is that 75% of these workloads are actually built off of open source software or custom in-house built solutions that incorporate some amount of open source software. And so what that really kind of indicates is that the entire HPC ecosystem is kind of built off of people who are really into open source software. So if you'll be able to kind of see it here, it might be a little dark, but effectively it's just like 
pretty popular image of Atlas holding up the world. So the world itself is uh, high performance computing. And then the people doing that are kind of the maybe nameless or necessarily you know, maintainers that spend a lot of time just working on software. And so you know, kind of taking this situation into account, what we realize is that there's clearly a need to have a robust open source e ecosystem built around high performance computing. And so, you know, as Ubuntu, you know, very widely used distribution, you know, popular, quite like Red Hat itself, um, you know, we realized like, hey, you know, we want to be able to start a community team, actually pivot our resources and understand how, you know, we can kind of work to actually support this industry. But there's, you know, an interesting question here where how do you start up a new team within a long established community? So coming this October, Ubuntu will be 20 years old. Um, actually today, Debian just celebrated its 31st birthday. So very long history, you know, lots of culture, you know, lots of kind of, you could say unspoken rules, you know, a lot of lessons learned and all that. And so it can be very daunting um, to actually come in and say like, hey, I want to do this new thing with your community that's been around for a long time. You cool with it? And so, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we started doing that. So it all kind of started um, with this image here. If you're wondering what this image is from, it's actually from our I'd say our first Ubuntu Summit after quite a few year hiatus um, in 2022. Um, it was in Prague, and it was kind of right after, or recently after I had joined Canonical. Um, and so I was having a pretty good time. And you know, I'm right there in the little corner there. I was kind of like trying to jump, but I had some terrible shoes that were like choking my feet, so I like couldn't move at all. But um, the key thing that I realized while I was there is that you know, I'm not the only person who's actually thinking about this problem and focusing on it. And so really what I'm trying to say is that I'm not the only person who is trying to actually look, take the Ubuntu operating system and understand how can we actually make it good for high performance computing. And so effectively what you'll see, you know, kind of staged right here is effectively there were two organizations. Um, the first one, obviously Canonical, which is the primary sponsor of Ubuntu Linux and another company called OmniVector, which specializes in, you know, deploying managed HPC clusters um, for clients. And we were both at the Ubuntu Summit, you know, giving talks. And throughout the weekend, what we kind of realized is that we have a lot of things that we're working on together. So for example, you know, we are really working with like independent third party software vendors. Um, so that's a really common problem with, you know, Ubuntu's adoption in HPC. So for example, a lot of vendors will actually go and, you know, do the work with organizations like Red Hat to certify their applications. Um, unfortunately, a lot of that support doesn't really exist for Ubuntu, and so that was something we were trying to change. Another issue was like application enablement. So if you kind of look at a lot of scientific software, it's very much built around like scientific Linux or CentOS. Um, and so you know we were basically looking at that open source software and seeing what work had to be done to make it compatible with Ubuntu and Debian. Another thing was also community engagement. You know, teaching folks about hey, we're out here, we're doing stuff, we're having a good time. You know, why don't you have a come have a good time with us? Um, and then also looking at infrastructure development, so seeing what popular HPC applications are there out there, you know, how are people building their clusters, and making sure that that software works on Ubuntu. And then the last thing is just, you know, tasks that everyone's probably had to deal with, which is actually just packaging. So taking software that people want and making it actually packaged up for your distribution so they don't have to go like curl pipe in the bash from the internet or something like that. Another common interest that we had was a shared interest in Slurm Charms. So without getting a little too into the details with like what that specifically is, effectively what Charms are is similar to say like operators in Kubernetes. Um, they're kind of logic defined as code for a lifecycle manager that Canonical maintains called Juju. And so effectively, kind of where we had that overlap was that we had a shared interest in building out these Charms for the Slurm workload manager. Um, and so, you know, we were doing kind of a lot of work separately, but kind of together. So it was like OmniVector had the Slurm Charms that they had developed, and then we had Slurm Charms that we were looking at develop. And what we kind of realized is that, you know, hey, we're both kind of duplicating effort trying to build the pieces um, of a larger puzzle. And at that point, you know, a realization happened, you know, where we kind of asked ourselves, why work separately when we could work together? Um, the other realization is, what if we combined our development um, resources and best practices, so kind of understanding like how we write Python compared to how they write Python, how do we make it sustainable, how do we quickly squash bugs, you know, respond to CVEs. And the last thing is probably maybe everyone's favorite, what if we met every week to have meetings and actually kind of discuss the project's development? 
And well, after we had that conversation, you know, little picture there where it's like, don't actually do this where you're just kind of copying off each other, but you know, trying to develop the same thing. We established Ubuntu HPC. Um, so this here um, is a community logo. If you're, say, familiar with the Ubuntu logo, effectively it's kind of a play on the same idea where it's like the circle of friends, but it's built out into kind of an atom to show the community of scientists that come together to use HPC clusters. So after we establish this, the next question is obviously, well, teamwork is the dream work, but how is it actually going? So like, you know, what have we kind of learned? You know, what tools are we using and how are we actually being able to sustain this community development together? So the first thing is, is that we actually meet every Wednesday. Um, we've been doing it for about a year and a half now. We host a 30-minute public call that anyone can join. Um, and so for that, we actually use Jitsi. Um, I know I was listening to a funny discussion about how roached uh, Cisco WebEx was, um, which is reasonable because I actually don't like WebEx at all, um, and understanding different tools. So the reason that we actually went ahead and chose Jitsi was because of the fact that it's open source and also be that you don't need an account, so there's not kind of a whole lot of data privacy concerns about who's logging what and who's using it to train what, um, and instead just like, hey, you know, we just need to be able to see our faces and communicate with each other. And kind of the purpose of these calls is to actually just get ahead, you know, see how each other are doing, discuss what current priorities are, you know, invite people to come challenges. So, you know, somebody pings me on IRC or Matrix, um, you know, I can say, hey, come to our call and talk about it. Um, and also just kind of invite different organizations to demo the work that they're currently doing. Um, and then also the other thing is too, is we use it as an opportunity to discuss and propose changes to what we're working on together. And then if you kind of look there at the bottom there, that's actually the meeting link that we have. So it's hosted publicly. Please don't put it in a spam bot server. I would appreciate that because they like the fact that I kind of claim that link. But um, yeah, that's what we use. And then another thing is, is that we actually use Matrix for communication. So I know a lot of open source projects kind of based around IRC, but as someone who was born in the 2000s, I refused to log into IRC. Um, I would much rather use modern communication clients. Um, so for example, we uh, went ahead and chose Matrix. And so there were a couple of reasons for that. Um, the first one was being that we wanted to help Ubuntu as a community entirely trailblaze kind of its matrix adoption, find out what the kinks are, what you know compatibilities and incompatibilities there are. Um, we also wanted to be able to use the bots that it was capable of offering. So for example, like it has a really nice GitHub bot for saying when somebody opens a new pull request, when someone opens an issue, when someone opens a discussion. And then we also have like RSS bots that help us kind of aggregate updates. So say if like a news source publishes a new update or we open a blog post, um, we're able to kind of then aggregate those updates and actually be able to read them kind of in just one central place. Um, the other thing that helps with Matrix is that moderation is always key. Um, I think it was like, what, eight months ago now, there was like a huge spam wave that attacked Matrix. Um, and so we had the federated bot so that I could actually focus on working on HPC instead of kicking out people being goobers. Um, and then the last thing also was like, it really helped with uh, having a common space to get in touch with other teams. So obviously we're focused on high performance computing, but there's a lot of overlap of other work that teams are doing. So for example, like Ubuntu developers, um, the different technologies that we work with, with like Juju, um, Snaps as well. It's just kind of nice to be able to have one place to ask those questions without having to have a bajillion different accounts that you need to manage. And the last thing that I just kind of wanted to say here was like, one thing that Matrix really tries to sell is this concept of bridging, where effectively if you have like the three people who refuse to stop using Slack or IRC or anything like that, you can set up this bridge that effectively allows communication to happen back and forth. Um, but it's not really worth it. It's not great. Um, kind of found a lot of issues with incompatibilities. And then also the fact that like certain things just wouldn't work properly, like uh, sending emojis to react to messages. Um, and also bridges would kind of crash very often. So like updates would come like six hours late after the conversation has like completely moved on to something else. And so then kind of the other reason for wanting to go ahead and um, use Matrix was actually um, earlier this year, the Ubuntu community officially adopted Matrix as a chat protocol um, for the community. So it just kind of made sense to actually go ahead and do it because there was a very big push to kind of start moving away from IRC and all these other more proprietary platforms and just kind of have one place where we could host the home server on Ubuntu.com. Another thing that we found that was uh, pretty helpful was having some kind of shared place to actually have documents. Um, so obviously you need meeting notes. You know, if you're discussing design of different open source components, you know, you want everyone to be involved in that discussion. You don't want to kind of have hush-hush meetings behind 
close doors and then come back and say, I want this thing. And it's like completely disregard the requirements of someone else. Um, so it's very important to kind of have documents that can be hosted publicly and yet also make sure that they're locked down in such a way um, that nobody can just like mess with them or delete all your documentation. And so it was a bit of an interesting story to actually go ahead and figure out how to do that. Um, so originally we started using Etherpad, which I think a lot of projects use. Um, we kind of had some issues with stability. The service we were using um, kept going offline or losing connection. And so it was like, well, I guess we just don't have an agenda today and stuff like that. Um, after that, we then went ahead and moved to Google Docs. And specifically, the issue with that is like Google Docs is like really great for collaborative work. But the issue is, is that if your Google Drive is like super locked down, um, you have to go through a lot of really nitty gritty stuff with your information science folks or uh, you know, information uh, services and all that and have to kind of work with them to actually be like, hey, can you give all these accounts access? And like, hey, we also might just have like random people adding stuff to this. And then that quickly breaks down and becomes kind of difficult to manage. And so then eventually we went to this new service that's on uh, stage left up here um, called HackMD, which is effectively just uh, collaborative um, markdown notebooks. Um, I heard it's quite popular within the Rust project and all that. Um, so we went ahead and decided to go with using that. Um, and so we found it works quite nice. Um, one thing that we usually try to do before each of our weekly calls is set up um, just like a meeting agenda. So that way, you know, we're kind of making the most of the 30 minutes that we're actually working together with because like we're all very busy people. You know, we have lots of different priorities um, and make sure that, you know, we're not just having meetings for having the sake of having meetings and instead focusing on how, you know, we can, you know, what to discuss and uh, what to do. And then the other thing um, that we're actually doing together is we are developing a collaborative project called Charmed HPC. Um, so I actually gave a talk yesterday that really went through like the whole picture here. Um, but effectively what we've been doing um, for pretty much the past year here is actually working on building um, a high performance computing solution, fully open source um, that anyone can actually go ahead and use. Um, and then the idea is that, you know, it's a lot of work to build a fully working cluster that can be deployed to any public cloud, private cloud, hybrid cloud. Um, and so basically what we do is that all the components in here we collaboratively work on together. And so one thing that I kind of want to discuss is that obviously, you know, A, you have your successes, you know, you have your projects that you're working on, you're developing things. But the other thing is too is that everybody regrettably has to spend some time in the school of hard knocks um, where you basically just have to say you try things, it doesn't work, you know, people get upset. And you know you have to kind of pivot or take negative feedback that doesn't feel so good, but you know you need to address. And so one thing that I wanted to share was what have we learned over time. So the first big lesson um, that we really learned was how you engage with your community is really important. Um, and when I say that, it's you know kind of the tone that you take, the way that you talk to them can really affect how the project goes. And so. Kind of the concept that I wanted to highlight here was the difference between talking at your community and actually talking with your community. And so talking at your community, um, kind of a common issue that starts to happen is that people kind of fall into this, you know, say drivel of like you're just reading release notes or you're just, you know, basically quoting your daily status update at your community people. Um, so for example, you know, say like, oh, you know, you just show up and say we're going to do this, this, and that without really opening the door for actually taking in any feedback or making the folks in the call or your community actually feel like you're going to take their feedback and actually build it into what you're doing. Um, and so what we learned is that it's really important to kind of phrase things more as rather than status updates, actually open things for discussion, you know, kind of see like ask folks, you know, in the call or over email or even over matrix, like, hey, what's your experience? You know, what's your thoughts on this? Like we're thinking of changing like how we set up C groups and all that. Um, so what are you thinking? And then usually, ideally, you know, when folks are able to be heard and actually provide feedback, they definitely feel a lot more engaged with the project. And then lesson number two, really important thing that we also learned, was optimizing for where you want to be versus optimizing where for you currently are. And effectively what, I guess maybe a quote that's applicable here is, don't put your cart before the horse. Um, and so one thing is that when you're first starting a new community team or actually interested in kind of building up your project. Um, one thing that I find is that, oh, it's very easy to quickly get like delusions of grandeur and kind of think very far off in the future and be like, 
oh, you know, when our project's big and everybody's using it, you know, we're going to have the steering committee, we're going to have the technical board, you know, we're going to have the code of conduct panel and all that. But really, when you're just a group chat of four dudes, that's way too much. Um, and people kind of get burned out. They get frustrated because you're like, oh, well, you can't contribute because you're not on the technical board. You're a new contributor. And it's like, nobody's doing the work, so why are you stopping me? And it's like, well, because we had a call one day and we decided to set these rules. Um, and so that can be very frustrating very quickly, become very cumbersome, basically put a lot of top-down pressure on your community contributors. And so it's more or less important to actually look at where you currently are and kind of build your project around that. Um, so for example, it's like, oh, if you're just like a small group of people who need to be able to actually talk directly with one another, it's better to just instead of say, have this room that's dedicated for this conversation, have this room that's dedicated for that conversation, have this email chain that we have to follow. Instead, it's just like, oh, we just have one group chat room that we actually go ahead and talk in. The next thing, um, lesson, that we kind of want to talk about is, uh, you know, asking for permission before attempting to do something new and innovative versus actually just going ahead and doing it. Um, and so one thing that I always find a little interesting specifically about the Ubuntu community is that it's a silent duocracy. And duocracy, I think, is something that folks have been talking about a lot. But where I first learned about the concept of duocracy was actually from one of our community council members, um, Merlin Shrevitz. I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Um, but effectively, he gave a very interesting talk um, at the previous Ubuntu Summit kind of talking about how, well, you know, if you read the Ubuntu Code of Conduct, it talks a lot about meritocracy, which obviously has a lot of different meanings to a lot of different folks. Um, but really what Ubuntu is all about is being kind of a silent duocracy where effectively we kind of really reward and encourage people to just, you know, see a problem they care about and actually just kind of organize themselves around actually working together to address it. And so I think it's very easy when you kind of see a problem that you want to fix um, like for our example, like, hey, we want to make Ubuntu way better for high performance computing. You know, it's very easy to lock ourselves down and say, well, you know, I don't want to just go ahead and form a group and then somebody gets mad or what if there's someone out there who's potentially doing it and they just haven't thought of actually speaking up. And it's better to actually just go ahead and do it and say, hey, I'm starting this group chat, you know, jump in if you're interested. Um, here's, you know, our GitHub org where all our artifacts are hosted. Are you interested in contributing? And then kind of there, you can optimize from there where it's like someone's like, hey, I've been doing this, and find how to build it. And big thing that I find important, um, lesson to take away from here is like, even if you're a leader, you know, don't always try and put yourself in the limelight. Always be the person who's like, oh, I'm the greatest. You know, everyone loves me. I'm the guy who leads the project. And really focus on opportunities to actually build up other people, because I find that creates a lot healthier collaboration where folks aren't feeling like, oh, if I don't like strictly own my commits or anything like that, you know, people are going to act like I didn't do anything. So it's important to actually just do it, but also be cognizant that other people want to contribute as well. And then kind of the fourth lesson that I really wanted to touch on was, um, you know, it's super important to have a streamlined um, onboarding process for new community members. This is something that we're actually still working on and kind of I wouldn't say struggling with, but something we're kind of finding we now have to address where effectively it's like you have somebody who pops into your discourse forum or somebody stumbles upon our project on GitHub or joins our room um, on Matrix and says like, hey, I'm really happy to be here. I want to go ahead and contribute to your project. And then, you know, kind of as us as the maintainers, the people who are kind of really in the day to day of the project are just like, well, that's great, but uh, we don't really know what there is for you to do. Um, and then that kind of then creates the issue where it's effectively you have this really motivated community member who then just goes ahead and drops out because he's like, well, these people don't know what they're doing. I'm going to go somewhere else where I can actually have an impact. Um, and so it's actually kind of important to really focus and spend time on how you bring new people in. So I imagine a good chunk of us in here are actually engineers. You know, We've all been through some kind of company onboarding process, having some sort of mechanism that help, helps us actually come into the company. And the same process is actually very important to have for your community. If you want folks to contribute to your project, you need to kind of have a set defined way of how they can get started, how you do things, and where they can go to get more information about what you're doing. And so obviously, you don't want the first top condition here of where you just don't know what to do when somebody new shows up. And you would instead want to have like, hey, this is where you can go. You know, Here's the new member portal. You know, Try this tutorial. Here's some bug fixes, good first issues that are easy for someone who's just getting started with us. And so those are kind of 
the four major lessons that we've had, obviously, I'm learning something new every day about community management where it's like somebody's like, hey, you know, I want to do this or I'm not happy about this or hey, here's how we could potentially change something. And I say like, oh, that's great. You know, I didn't even think about that. So it's very much an iterative process. But um, one thing that I want to say is like, obviously it doesn't stop here. So when I say that, it means that like, even though I'm giving this talk today, um, we're still doing lots of work, you know, go back to where I live in Pittsburgh and logging in the computer and writing the code. And so one thing that I wanted to do, highlight here was our goals for the future. So obviously, got to go fast, you know, lots of work is being done. You know, one thing that we really want to focus on is, you know, quickly building our community up um, and kind of start marching towards an alpha for the projects that we're building together and also as we start working on the alpha of like Charmed HPC, you know, one thing that we want to make sure is that we have the necessary community components there so people feel welcome and invited and able to contribute. Um, and so here's kind of some of our goals that we have for the future. Um, top ones are ones that we've kind of already finished and done before, you know, coming here today for this talk. And so for example, the first thing that we did was become an official Ubuntu team. So we're actually officially recognized, so we kind of went from being a little bit of a group that was kind of hanging out over here and work with the canonical community team and other folks within the Ubuntu community um, to become officially approved. Um, the other thing is too is we've actually attended quite a few open source events um, to promote our community. Um, and the idea is that we want to say like, hey, we're getting together and doing this thing. Um, if you're interested, you know, join on. Or even if, you know, lesson number four where we're like, hey, we're kind of struggling with figuring out how to create new user onboarding and new contributor onboarding. If anyone has any ideas, I'd really appreciate you sharing them. Um, things that we have in progress, um, the first one is releasing an early alpha of Charmed HPC. Obviously what's really important is as a community we're working towards um, building a stable release of this product so that people can actually go ahead and start playing with it and start using it. Obviously the other thing that's very important is documentation. So you can't just be like, hey, how do I use this thing? And it's like, oh, it's all in here, man. You know, Just uh, send me a message if you have some issues. Um, so we're working on creating a documentation website um, that can go ahead and people can log into so that way we don't need to kind of be there constantly and hold people's hands with deploying Charmed HPC. And then the last three tasks here are just things that we're slowly working towards, um, or I wouldn't say slowly, we're moving pretty fast, but um, the idea is that we want to write new user and new contributor um, onboarding guidelines. Um, so for example, somebody comes in, you know, we want to say like, hey, this is our standards for how we write Python, this is our standards for how we write Go, um, and then here's how you can kind of experiment with the project, and here's where you can go to give feedback if you have issues or anything like that. The other thing is publishing education videos. So I did see a funny quote, I can't remember where, but someone was like, videos aren't documentation. You can't just like screen record yourself deploying something and saying, hey, I did it, I documented it. But I think the idea is that it's really helpful, um, especially for things like, say, Kubernetes, where you just kind of have these like really short 15 minute videos where you just kind of deep dive on a specific component um, just to teach folks about it. And the last thing that we want to do is um, be able to kind of start regularly blogging about um, community success and kind of things that folks have gone off and done. Because um, I think it's once again one of those things where it's like, you know, yay, I'm the leader, you know, I want all the, you know, kind of the clout, but I think it's important to also share the spotlight with what other folks are doing and kind of the success that they're having. And so, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it here. Um, quickly here, just want to share a QR code. Um, we actually are, have our public matrix, um, if you're interested in joining, you know, if you have any experience with community management, um, or you're just kind of interested in the work that we're doing, um, we would definitely appreciate you joining our matrix server. Um, hopefully the matrix.2 link is working. I tested it earlier. Um, but the idea is that you know we're always looking for feedback. We're always looking for ideas and want people to feel welcome or tell us how we can do better. So feel free to jump in. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, that's my talk. And then same QR code as the private slide because sometimes I talk too fast. Um, so yes, any questions? Hey, I see someone. Question? So obviously the community is really new, but um, how have you gone about, I assume testing requires like pretty significant hardware and stuff. So have, is there any sh push for like community test beds or I guess how does that work with um, high performance uh, hardware? So testing is a little bit um, interesting because obviously as you mentioned like, you know, yay, we can deploy it on a laptop and that doesn't really give us good feedback of what a production use case will look like. Um, and so 
Currently, what we found to work is that everyone just kind of brings to the table what they're capable of. Um, so for example, as Canonical, you know, we have a lot of partnerships with different public clouds and different partners. Um, and so effectively, we can bring our resources that we have with them um, and use that to actually test the work that we're doing. Um, and then also some of our community partners, you know, they have enterprise contracts with other people. And so they can go out and kind of collect that direct feedback from those customers and say, what's not working? But we, they need us to fix and all that. And then they just kind of share it. So I wouldn't say that we have shared resources that we test on, but you know we kind of have an understanding of being transparent about you know the issues that we're experiencing with the folks that we're working with. Gotcha. And, and through sponsorship and canonical yeah. sponsorship, you're managing that. Okay. Yeah, cool. Thank yeah. you. Good question. Thank you. Folks, have any other questions? All right. I think we're good. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for paying attention. Thank you.